Welcome to another edition of Biblical Life TV. You know, there's been a lot of things going on the last couple of weeks, and it seems like when God starts one project, he'll start seven. I think it's awesome because whatever God gives you an assignment for, he always gives you the grace to do it. And uh, the new book is underway for uh, Defender Publishing. That part of what I'm teaching here is going to be unfolded into the second part of the book. And uh, we got all kinds of things going on. There's a fresh anointing with it, and I'm really excited about it. I want to go into a, a, uh, just a quick overview last in our last session. We discovered that when John, when he said, in the beginning was the Word, he was referring to the Olive Tav in Genesis 1.1. That Jesus is the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and Omega. That Messiah had a, has a special part in the creation of the earth and a unique role in the salvation of mankind. And that the fall of Lucifer wrought chaos, darkness, and unreality to God's creation. In fact, this even speaks against Luciferian doctrine. Luciferian doctrine says that it was not the Lord God who created the heavens and the earth, that it was Lucifer. And that Yahweh got jealous and, and began to try to take over mankind is what Luciferians believe. Yet all of that, when you actually understand Genesis 1, it's actually the opposite. Almighty God created heaven and earth, and when Lucifer showed up, he brought chaos. And then so God recreated the earth, and then as soon as he gets that done and he creates a garden, what happens? The devil comes in, shows up, and what does he bring? He brings sin and reality and chaos and darkness again. But how many know the answer for that is the Olive Tav? The answer for that is Messiah. The answer for that is what he did for us on the cross. And then we discovered that when God, God's fix for what happened in Genesis 1-2 is he began to command, he spoke commandments into his creation, and his creation had enough sense to respond to those commandments. Selah. God is still issuing forth commandments in his word, and if we respond to them, that anointing that is contained in that commandment is released in our lives. Just the same way when God said, let there be light, and he actually framed time in that commandment. And because we have linear time now is because that commandment is still in force and resonant on the inside of him is the power to create time. How many know that's a lot of power? It creates our dimensional reality in the first commandment of God. Every commandment of God has that same kind of resident power on the inside of it. So that when you keep a commandment, how can you not but be blessed? Come on. You might as well get happy because I'm, I'm in happy mode this morning. All right? And finally, the only way to reestablish divine order in our lives once Satan has released this chaos is we've got to have the work of God plus the distinct work of Messiah in our lives, and third, the commandments of God. That was God's formula in the garden or before the garden. It was God's formula after the garden with the promise of the completed work of Messiah, and after the cross, it's still God's formula. So you're ready to get into 1 John again this morning. I want to go to 1 John chapter 1, starting with verse 1 once again. And we need to understand that John is a faithful witness. He witnessed all the things that happened during the ministry of Jesus. In fact, he has a unique position at the Last Supper when the Bible says that his head was laid on the, the chest of Jesus during the Last Supper. He was, of course, the youngest, and so he was able to get away from that. I think it would kind of look kind of weird if maybe Peter had done that. You have this old burly man with his head up laying on Jesus, but he was a young and but he heard the heartbeat of God. Maybe, there, maybe that's the reason why he was so in tune with Jesus that on the cross, Jesus gave the custodianship of his mother over to the apostle John. And he says, I'm a faithful witness. Listen to this. That which was from the beginning, which what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and that life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. 
he begins giving us this testimony. He says, let me tell you another way of defining this word, this olive tav. He's life. He's the word of life. There is no other name in heaven and earth that one might be saved except for the name of Jesus. Now contrast that to the work of Lucifer. Come on now. In John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, Jesus says, and so Jesus said unto them, truly, truly, he's repeating himself as a rabbi here, biblically or hebraically, when there's repetition, it's extremely important. And there's only a couple things in the word of God that's brought to the superlative of three. The most important is that God is holy, holy, holy. So here Jesus is saying, truly, truly, he's getting ready to peel the curtain back on some things and reveal some things to us. I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now that can be taken two ways. How many know that God's original intent on this planet was everybody was supposed to be a sheep of his pasture? So Jesus is the door to planet earth. But since everything got messed up, Jesus is now the door to God's pasture. Both are true. All that come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I think he's talking about the elect, don't you? He's talking about the remnant. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I am come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Since Jesus has this distinct role in creation as the olive top and the salvation of mankind, he is and he only is the door to this planet. So I don't care if you land in a spaceship, if you didn't come through Jesus, you're a thief and you're a robber with what's getting ready to come. Lucifer came in another way. Lucifer shows up in Genesis 1-2 where all of a sudden the world became darkness. He snuck into the garden as a serpent another way and lifted himself up above man and caused man to fall. How I many know Jesus did not give him authority or give him rights to enter into the garden? But what God did is he said, now guard the garden because stuff can sneak in, Adam. Guard it and keep it. And he snuck in another way. But it didn't just stop there. The watchers of Genesis chapter 6 came in another way. They came in another way and they started doing things that God had not authorized, which produced giants and darkness. I even propose that the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and wicked spirits in heavenly places that the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 came in another way. All the false messiahs that came before Jesus and after Jesus came in another way. You see, John is very emphatic that, you know what, I've seen the word. This word that was with God before creation. I have seen him. I have heard him. I've, I've touched him. Not only that, I've received life from him. The apostle John is the faithful witness. The same way that we're supposed to be witnesses. If, you've, if you have known Jesus, if you've been touched by him, then you become a witness of who he is in the earth. We need to realize that if you're going to have life and have it abundantly, the only way through that is through Jesus of Nazareth. Now, in my book, I'm going to be getting into, in in the second part of it, we we have those saying, you know, unless you use the name Yeshua or can pronounce the Tetragrammaton, and to be truthful, the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav heh the fancy name in theology is Tetragrammaton, or that which is unspeakable. They say unless you pronounce that, you can't be saved. Well, my thing is, if you really look at that, then why wasn't the Apostle Paul holding Hebrew classes? 
Why wasn't the Apostle Paul teaching them Hebrew and having them read the Hebrew Scriptures? He was he picked up, because God in his wisdom, by the time the Apostle Paul was here for at least a century, the Septuagint was already available in Greek. And the reason most of the New Testament is written in Greek is God planned, all before Malachi even wrote his stuff, that he was going to bring the Gentiles into the church. And God strategically placed everything and simply wrote in the common language of the day. Nor is there instruction for us, as the Bible says, every, every tongue shall confess, every, every language, every tribe shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And there's nowhere in the Scriptures that instructs us to teach them Hebrew so they can call on his name in Hebrew. They can call on his name in their language, and heaven still recognizes it. It's just, and, and we even... It's even problematic in English because when you say Jesus, we're not necessarily talking about the Olive Tav. There's the New Age Jesus. There's the Prosperity Jesus. There's this Jesus. There's, there's the Wimpy Jesus. Everything's okay. The Jesus that lines up with the Bible that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come in the flesh is the right one. And if you call on him in English, J-E-S-U-S, you're going to be saved if you're trusting in his completed work at the cross. And you yield to him. Just like if you were living in Mexico and, and you spoke Spanish, you would call on the name of Jesus because that is his name in Spanish. There is no instruction anywhere when you go into all these other countries, you teach them how to speak Hebrew. You know, it's amazing. We get so caught up in these other things because I think there's a lot of Yeshua's out there that are being taught today that aren't really the one revealed in Scripture. Let's get back to the basics. Let's find out who he is. And his name is so great it can be spoken in every language and every tongue. But he said, I'm a, I'm a faithful witness of this. He goes on to say, picking up here in verse 2, and that life was manifested. We have seen and we have testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, the one sitting right next to Elohim in Bereshit 1, and was manifested to us. What we have seen and what we have heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy might be made complete. Now, here is how we separate the chaff from the wheat. This is how we separate a lot of things. It doesn't matter what's on the door of your church. It doesn't matter what denomination that you're of. It doesn't matter whether you say you're a Christian or not. You see, one of the things that's being taught today is if anybody says they're a Christian, I must have fellowship with them. I've got to overlook everything, and I must have fellowship with them because we must have unity of the saints. A wheat cannot have fellowship with a tear. Sheep can't have fellowship with goats, much less wolves. And so the Apostle Paul, he says, I'm preaching who Jesus really is, or the Apostle John, I'm preaching who Jesus really is so that you can have fellowship with us. And then he says, now wait a minute, indeed, or the, the thing that connects us is we're in fellowship with the Father. Because we have been brought in fellowship with the Father, we have been born again, we have this new nature, we have the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of us, and we have been adopted as children of God. Because of that, I can have fellowship with you, if you're not born again, I cannot have, I cannot enter into that kind of fellowship. Sila, think about that for a minute. When, when I was in the military, I was all over the world. And you could walk into a church, and when the Holy Spirit was moving, you could tell those that were his and those that weren't, those that were just doing it because it was the religious thing to do. There was not that kindred spirit connection. We need to quit going by what we hear and by what we see, and we need to start perceiving by the Spirit of God. If the Holy Spirit is on the inside of that person because they're following Jesus, some of their doctrines may be a little off because we're all in process. Did anybody get saved and your head was right to begin with? Come on now. We're all in process. We're all learning. But I have seen people that their doctrines and their creeds are perfect, but they're not walking with God. They got a religious spirit and a religious spirit of superiority because our doctrine is perfect. Our creeds are perfect, but their hearts are impure. 
It's because I, because I have been brought in fellowship by Jesus to the Father. And I've got that new nature. That if you got that new nature and I got that new nature, it's the most, it is the most obvious thing that's going to happen is we're going to hang together. We can feel that connection. I feel that when I travel. I can go into churches. And sometimes what's scary to me is some of the leadership I can't connect to. I go, uh-oh. And so you back off and you pray and you let it watch over a couple, two, three years and you find that leadership blows up and implodes on itself because it did not have the walk with God. It knew how to have church. It knew how to build a religious organization and it knew how to do things to please the people to get the thing puffed up and growing up. But it, it, it could not draw from the heart of Father God because they weren't in fellowship with Father God. They were, they were in fellowship with their religious system and knew how to work the system. I have determined in my own life, I'm not going to work a system. I'm just going to live in the kingdom. I don't trust in gimmicks or anything else. But he's emphatic here. I want you to have fellowship with us, but the only way you can have fellowship with us is you've got to have fellowship with him. And when you have fellowship with him, the reason we're preaching the gospel is so that our joy might be complete because then you're going to be able to know him the way I know him. And if you know him the way I know him, we can get along. That is the point of fellowship. It can't just be that all of our T's are crossed and our, and our, dots are, our, our I's are dotted the exact same way because that doesn't really mean a lot if that person just has a religious spirit. It doesn't mean that because we all come from the same church group or that we all absolutely dress alike. I've been part of groups that uh, I remember years ago when, when I graduated United Theological Seminary, they were all men in black because that's the way Dr. Lang dressed. Except they weren't as cool as Will Smith in it. I mean, black suit, black tie, white shirt, everybody. It was cookie cutter. Same, you know, Thompson Chain Reference Bible. All they needed was their secret ray gun. And they, they, could, have been, they could have been serving with, with the men in black. And unless you found clean shave and you couldn't have a beard, you had to have your hair cut real short. Because of that, that was their mode. And you can't smoke, can't chew, and can't date girls who do. Okay? That was their basic creed, and if you could fit into that mold, you were one of them. Any religious spirit will fit into any mold when it serves its purpose. The only mold it can't really fit into is the elect because it's on the inside out. Therefore, we've got to start perceiving by the Spirit in the days ahead. Does your heart connect with them because they're connected to the Father? We've got to have that. Let's go on here in verse 5. The truth of God, his kingdom, and his children. This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Underline that in your Bible. That God is light and that there is no darkness darkness in him at all. That contrasts itself from many of the other religions of the earth. Even within the Greek religion, all their gods were both good and bad. That they were petty. That even their, their king god Zeus, if your wife was too attractive while you were away at battle or away in the field, he would take your form so that he could come and have relations with your wife. How many know we don't need that kind of god? Or you go into Taoism or, or within the Orient, and they, they, you ever see the yin-yang, that, that everything must be balanced and so that within God there's both light and darkness to bring balance to the universe. And there's, there's even some that I have seen that have tried to explain Lucifer as a manifestation of the dark side of God. The Apostle, the Apostle John looks at that and calls it hogwash. That in God he is light there is absolute righteousness, absolute holiness, absolute perfection, and in him is absolutely no darkness at all. The whole concept of darkness came, what Lucifer, when iniquity was found in him, he used the anointing he had from God and perverted himself and created darkness. It originates in Lucifer, the one who brings chaos, not God who brings order. Order. 
Then he goes on to say, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, you know, brother, everybody's just got to sin. Is that what it says? Or you know, brother, the sin problem has been taken care of because, you know, the Torah got nailed to the cross and therefore there is no more sin anymore. We can just walk. Is that what the Word says? Now, I don't care what preachers say on TV. I'm talking about the Word. And when you talk about the writings of John, they are the, they are the resting crown on top of all the Word of God. They are God's last Word that when John wrote John, the book of John, 1 John, and the Revelation, it sealed the book. That's it. And so in the last writings, he said that if you say you have fellowship with him but are still living like the world, are still living like a sinner, you are a liar. Don't you love this? Don't you just love the apostle of love? I found out sometimes love is the straightest shooter. Love will tell you how the cow chews the cabbage if the love really loves you. We have this pseudo kind of love that just everything's okay and everything. That isn't love. That's passivity. And we see a lot of times. In fact, I, I saw this week this little poster, and it said, what would Jesus do? And it said, within the parameters of, of that whole concept is the thought of him turning over tables and making a whip and chasing people out of the temple. That was love in motion because he had love for the Father. He just didn't say, oh, it's okay. You just need to tweak this, that, and the other to make it plausible. He just overturned tables, chased them out. Jesus opened up a can of whoop capitalism, <laughs> if you will. Doesn't mean he was a socialist either. With all the things that are going out, you got to throw that out too. It was capitalism gone a monk. But it says... If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. The King Chem says to do the truth. I actually, and both of them mean the same thing. I'll, sometimes the NASB brings that stuff a little bit better. How many know you've got to practice righteousness? You've got to put it into practice. A lot of the word won't do you a bit of good. You can quote it all day long, but unless you begin practicing, it's never activated in your life. You've got to hear and then you've got to do. James says, I'll be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. You've got to put it into practice. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, fellowship here in the Greek is konania, which means fellowship, association, community, joint participation, intercourse, intimacy. If I'm really intimate with God, and really, if I, if I don't have this intimacy with God, I've got to go back and look at where I am in my salvation process. That because I really know the Father, because the blood of Jesus has really brought me into where there's this intimacy with God, that, that I enjoy the presence of God, that I, I seek his face. That's that kononia that he's talking about here. If, if I do that, then my walk is going to change. And that word walk there, I love this, this Greek word. It means to make one's way to progress, to make due use of opportunity. For Hebrew for to live, to regulate one's life, to conduct one's self. If I say that I know him, I am going to regulate and conduct myself to do the things that he said and begin putting those things into practice. So if you say you know him and you don't put into practice the things that he says, do you really know him? Do you really understand him? Those that say they walk with Jesus yet do not practice righteousness, the Apostle John says, are liars. So hyper grace is addressed by John even in his day. I believe the doctrine of hyper grace has its, uh, has its base root in Gnosticism. 
There's no such thing as sin anymore. The cross took care of that. Therefore, now that we're saved, we can do whatever we want to do, and everything's fine. Just as long as you have your Willy Wonka golden ticket, you're going to make it to heaven. You're going to find out when you get to heaven, maybe God doesn't actually take them Willy Wonka tickets at all. That's just a thought. He kind of looks to see if there's a circumcision of heart. And if the name of Jesus is there, and the nature of Jesus is there in your heart. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So that if, if, if I'm really having fellowship with him, and I'm walking in the ways of God because the Holy Spirit is empowering me on the inside to walk in the ways of God, I can have fellowship with you. But he just doesn't stop there. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And in the Greek, that tense means to be continual. That as long as I'm walking in his ways, I'm maintaining that fellowship. I am in a constant state of the blood of Jesus constantly cleansing me. I am staying under his blood in all that I do. Does that make sense? And let me tell you something. There's a lot of people and there's a lot of preachers today that are preaching things that you can't do if you're living under the blood. You can't do it. It's impossible. Most of what is being called Christianity today is not a Christianity that exists under the blood. It exists outside of the blood. Ooh, there's something to make you pause just a little bit. If I've been brought into blood covenant with him, I've got to make sure that the life that I now live in Christ is subject to that blood and will only glow where that blood goes. That is in the characteristics of the blood. Now let's pick up here in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. So here we go again with hyper grace. I remember Dr. Mary Ann Brown told me when she was alive that she went to a minister's conference where he had apostles uh, coming over from all over. And this one got up and said, the sin problem is over. We are beyond the sin. And Jack Hayford was sitting up there in the front, and he began kind of, she said, he has this way about it when he doesn't agree with stuff. He, he gets this look on his face. He starts flipping his pen as he's making notes. And he gets up and says, well, brothers, if that's true, why does my ministry get however many hundreds of phone calls a month of ministers that have fallen into sin? He knew it was wrong. That's, we're not, the only way, you know, how, you know how you can get beyond sin? You just need to go on to heaven where sin doesn't exist. As long as you're here, there's going to be sin and sin is defined in the word as the violation of God's commandments, which is affirmed later on in 1 John. Sin in the garden was a violation of the commandments that Adam had in the garden. Sin God defined for us. Aren't you glad that God defined sin? Wouldn't it be unfair to hold something against you that he never told you what it was and it's like trying to hit a target that's invisible? But he said, now listen. He said, if, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Listen, we're going to mess up. What he's dealing with is the theology and the practice of sinning, saying you're doing it for God. And you can either do that by saying now this is no longer sin or that sin has been done away with, which would be an abdication of the laws of God or the commandments of God. If you say the commandments have done have been away with, then you're saying that sin's been done away with. That's his basic logic. And he says, if you do that, you have deceived yourself. But now listen, we mess up. It's not that we're practicing sin, but we're still in human flesh. And every once in a while, we'll mess up. Now, the moment we mess up, that part of our life steps outside of the blood. Now, here's a spiritual warfare tip for you. The devil can't touch what's under the blood. He can't touch what's under the blood. But if he can get you to stick your head out, 
Don't blame God when, it's got, when it gets taken off. Come on now. If you get a part of your life out of sight of the blood because there is unconfessed sin, you messed up and your theology won't even let you deal with it. You're open season for the devil. And then we have the audacity when all hell breaks loose. We hear testimonies like this. I'm mad at God because how could God have ever allowed that? He's a sovereign God. God can do anything. Yeah, he did. That's why he told you don't stick your head out from underneath the blood. No more than when you're in the military and the guys are saying, listen, when the enemy is shooting at you, don't stick your head up out of the foxhole and say, what's going on? You might just get it shot. we got to realize just how that's why the devil tries so hard to get you to sin and then to try to beat you in the head to try to get you to where you won't run to Jesus to get it to get it confessed because long as that sin is out there, he has a hook in you. And then he can pull more of you out and more of you out. And that, that, that's how Christian backslides. But if I'm maintaining koinonia, if I'm maintaining fellowship with the Father, when I do stumble, I get up, I, I get up, I repent, I bring it under the blood, and I reestablish that fellowship with him. Listen here what the word says. This you need to underline in your Bible. If we confess our sin, now this is a, an apostle writing to the Christian church. If the believer, when you do stumble and fall, if you confess your sin, he is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. Jesus did not wake up today and say, you know what, this is one of those days that if you confess your sin, I just don't feel like forgiving it today. You're just out of luck. He's faithful in that administration of forgiving your sin when you go to him and say, Lord, listen, I was trying and I messed up. The devil tripped me up. I got in the flesh. Lord, I'm sorry. Help me to, to maintain this fellowship with you and walk more in the power of your spirit. Help me crucify that part of my life. Please forgive me and let the blood of Jesus cleanse me from that. Not only is it a faithful thing, he is faithful. Look what it says next. And he is righteous to forgive our sins. In other words, because of what Jesus has done, heaven considers it a righteous thing on the part of Jesus, on the part of God. God considers it a righteous thing when you come to him and say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I violated your ways. That for him, extending that forgiveness is righteousness in motion. So he's not having to bend his rules or bend his nature to forgive you. If you're honest with him and run to the cross, heaven says God is moving righteously towards you when he forgives you of that sin and he brings healing to your life and he brings you back under the blood. It is, is not only that he is faithful, it is righteous for him to do that. Not only is he going to cleanse us, he says he's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Torah defines what's righteous and what's unrighteous. I, I like the debate here that the Apostle John does, light and darkness. You see, that's a Torah concept. The Torah, the law of God, defines this is light, this is darkness. This is holiness, this is unholy. This is clean, this is unclean separating the two. Only God can do that for us because we walked into a world of gray. That ever since the fall of Adam, everything has been gray. And then Jesus comes and brings us the light of God. And he says, listen, let me, let me, let me show you why Moses did what he did. I can go to Jesus and make perfect sense out of Moses every day. In fact, Moses sometimes shows Jesus more clearly than the Gospels do. We've got to separate these things. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, th this points back to hyper grace again in this day. Brother, there's no such thing as sin. All there is is love, 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 love. And there's no such thing as sin. And he said, listen, if we say that we have not sinned or that we, it's impossible to violate God's commandments because they've been done away with, we make him a liar. First, you were a liar, 
And now he goes on, he says, listen, this is, this is a righteous thing God's doing. No, no. The doctrines that are being taught today, first of all, that God's commandments have been done away with, that sin has been done away with, and that we never have to repent, it means that we are limiting the righteous acts of God in the earth. If I steal from him his divine right to forgive sin, I am taking away from him that which he is faithful over and allowing him to do the righteous act of forgiveness in the life of the believer. It's all right here. So what I'm basically doing is my theology is saying that God himself has bore false witness of his word. I make him out to be a liar. And then of a truth, his word is not in us. You see, we need to, when you start dealing with the remnant, you need to get your eyes off how big the ministry is, how flashy it is, how Hollywood it is, how pleasing to the flesh the words sound. Come on. You got to get into, is it preaching the integrity of God's word? And there is a continuity from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to the very end of the book of Revelation. It's one book written by one God with one purpose in mind, establishing his kingdom back in you. Any deviation from that that my theology is trying to make him out to be a liar. And how many know he's going to come back one day and he is going to have words with those who have tried to make him out to be a liar by dissecting his word. That was a problem in the Apostle John's day. It was called Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the birthplace of a lot of crazy stuff that goes on and is being taught in the body of Christ today. In fact, tradition says later on in, in his old age that, that John's knees were... The, the, tradition tells us that he, his knees basically look like camel's knees because he spent so much time on his knees praying. And only back then, yeah, there's a prayer warrior for you. He's got camel knees. You know, you don't hear that very often nowadays, but he did back then. And he went to this well. After this long journey, I mean, a lot of times whenever you travel, the first place you went to the well to get fresh water and to get cool water. And there were Gnostics there at the well. The apostle of love refused to drink from the same well as Gnostics because he, would, he was afraid they were, they, by him doing so, he was going to endorse what they were doing. You see, the apostle loved, loved truth so much he wouldn't have any fellowship with darkness. That's why in 1 John, he's such a straight shooter. And he takes a lot of theologies that are very popular today and he beats them upside the head because he says, I want to show you something. You're the liar and he isn't. I'm not going to stand here and allow your theologies and what you're preaching and what you're doing to make Almighty God a liar and you're trying to change his word. The truth is his word is not in you and you're a tear and not a wheat. You are not remnant material. And that's going to be crucial in the days ahead. As we go into the book of Revelation, you better know who's his and who's aren't. Because there are going to be people, guys, that are going to receive the mark of the beast, that are going to go with all this stuff. We can get a lot of things in the mark of the beast. I think, I think it's going to be one of the most religious things this planet has ever seen. It's going to be amalgamation of the new world order and transhumanism and a lot of different things. And it is going to be the new re religious fervor that we're going to see the promises Satan made in Genesis 3 begin to be fulfilled. And all those are going to run up to the tree of knowledge. Oh, I'm having Christians write me that are saying, you know, my, my kids are, are scientific minded and they're very analytical. And all of a sudden, they're doubting the word because you can't, you can't prove it by scientific basis. You see, science is one of the new religions, and it's a religion. And among, religi and among scientific people, they fight themselves more than Baptists fight with Pentecostals over the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They do. But most of us don't realize that when you look at Sir Francis Bacon, who formulated Baconian observation on how that science needs to be done by observation, he himself was an occultist. He knew there were things on the other side that you can't see. You can only see the manipulation of it on this side. Because they were founding a new religion. A Christian 
can look at religion and be a highly educated individual. The more he gets into quantum physics and, and astrophysics and all this, he sees the glory of God. Well, the same guy looks at it, he's tainted. His only religion is science. All he sees is everything being pulled away from God. We need to wake up. We need to wake up to where we are. We need to get back into this word. We need to, it needs to go back is, where are you really in your relationship with Jesus? There's an old Christian song done years and years ago, and it talked about evidence. Do you have enough evidence to convict you of being a believer? If you took out, I go to church every weekend, I do own two or three Bibles, I do write out a check to the church. If you took those things away, could somebody look at the way that you walk and accuse you of being like Jesus? Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit, not by their doctrines, not by the church they attend, not by where they give their tithe. It's time to become fruit inspectors. It's time to, really, to examine my, do I have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Do I have the fruit of this relationship of Messiah in me the way that I should? If not, I need to make sure that that fellowship is sure and consistent in my life. The closer you get to him, the more you start being like him. There's a, there's a comment made in, in Acts chapter 2. Peter gets up to preach, and he preaches and, it, and Peter is an uneducated fisherman. He wasn't like the Apostle Paul that had his Ph.D. from Gamaliel University or the School of Hillel. He was an uneducated fisherman that got up and his words absolutely pricked everybody to heart. And all the rabbis stood there with their mouths open at the, at the not only the eloquence of it, but the depth of understanding of it. And the Bible makes one interesting comment. And they remembered that they had been with Jesus. Does your life show that you've been with Jesus? Does your life show that you have this koinonia, this fellowship with the Father? Because if, I, if, I, if, I, if people start looking at me and say, you know what, he's been like Jesus, and that guy over there has been like Jesus, and that woman over there has been like Jesus, no wonder they get so long, along so much together because they're all being like Jesus with one another. That's what we're talking about. It's time that we, we transcend American Christianity. American Christianity is I visit God for a couple hours a week, but I'm living like the world 24-7. We need to be like Abraham. We need to walk out of Babylon to where I'm walking with Almighty God 24-7 and I visit the world when I need to to accomplish something for the kingdom. That's where we need to be. That's what we've got to do. And that's part of the essence of 1 John because unless that fellowship is sure You're not going to make it with what's to come. You will bow down and you will follow the Antichrist. I don't care what your creed is. The greater one has got to be sure on the inside of you, and when he's bigger than anything they put on the outside, your salvation and your walk is sure. Think about that. We'll pick up with chapter 2 next week. Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish where and two of you have sent it. And Father, right now, I water your word with prayer. Father, I not only thank you for those that are here, but Father, I thank you for everyone who watches this video, whether it's on YouTube or whether by DVD. Father, I loose an anointing that will overtake them, that will cause them, that Father, their passion in life will be to have fellowship with the Father. Their passion in life is to know him and to know that he's the Father of light and to let nothing come between him or her and the God of the Bible. No sin, no doctrine, no worldliness. But they will choose to walk just as Jesus walked and live a life that not only is a testimony of the power of the blood, but refuses to step from underneath its protective covering. And Father, I thank you and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name.